Mark, um, to Paula Edgar, and to the MBBA for having this really critical, important conversation. We usually have conversations about immigration and or traditional forms of civil rights in silos, uh, and, and to be in a space where we're talking about those things together, particularly as it affects black immigrants, is, is really important. So I guess I wanted to start with a little story and, and just thinking about how I come to this work. So I um, work a lot on immigration issues at CCR, and I recently had the opportunity to go to the uh, border, uh, particularly Texas-Mexico, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo border. And um, we were there because we're trying to bring a case uh, to challenge the practices currently that the United States is engaging in, which is um, unconstitutionally denying people the right to seek asylum. So under the Constitution, you're supposed to have an interview. You're supposed to get process if you come to the border and you said, I'm seeking asylum. And that's not happening. While I was, while I was there, I, I crossed and I went to a shelter in Mexico where I talked with a mom and her five-year-old little girl who three days before that um, were in another country, and I'm being a little vague because of confidentiality, but were in another country in uh, South America, and her husband, the little girl's father, had disappeared. Hours later, the mom was abducted and was told, um, if you don't leave the country, we're gonna murder you and your child. And she immediately, she was released, and she immediately got on a bus and went straight for Mexico to be able to cross into the United States. And when they got to the border and they explained their situation, and the mom was like, I'm, I'm terrified for my life, I'm terrified for my child, the border agent simply said, well, we don't believe you, and um, not only that, but made them sign a piece of paper in English that essentially said, we do not fear for our lives and, and we're not seeking asylum. And I had to, the little girl was just in the shelter, they've been there for four months, and she asked me at one point, she said, why won't they let us in? Like, why can't we just go? And it was such a hard moment for me because I, I actually didn't have a, 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 a great answer for her because in my mind it's because the United States has essentially othered people to not even look at you as a child. Um, and so I think that we, we are having this conversation in many ways because we want to save the lives of, of that mom and that little girl um, and, and the many other people affected by it. So full, full disclaimer, uh, in this panel we're gonna use some words or I'm gonna be using some words and I wanted to flesh out a little bit about what I'm talking about when I, when I use those words. So the panel is called The Resistance, Legal Solutions for Fighting Back. And the way that I use the word resistance is one in which predates the current administration that we're in. Right? So it's not the current administration that um, has only implemented violent immigration policies that, that affect our people. Second, when I say black, I am also including folks who are uh, Afro-Latinx, black Americans, Africans. I'm being very intentional when I say that word and in including all, all these groups. And third, when I say the word Latinx, I'm trying to be mindful and inclusive of, of people's gender expression. So it includes Latinas, Latinos, and people who don't identify as either. So, without further ado, I uh, am going to let each panelist introduce themselves and a little bit about the work that they do, and we're going to restrict it to one to two minutes for that. Thanks. First, um, my name is Carmen Carrillo. I am an immigrant. I'm from Guatemala. Um, I was brought here by my mother a long time ago, um, almost 30 years. And I do immigration defense work, I guess. Um, I represent a lot of um, immigrants from all walks of life, in mostly in Newark, New Jersey, and in uh, sometimes in New York. Um, I've been doing that for about eight years now. And I've also been to the border um, many, many years ago in 2002, and that's when I decided that I needed to become an immigration attorney, um, mostly because of stories like that. Um, and because once you're once you know what it's like to be an immigrant, you can't undo that feeling, you know. And you know how everyone, how some people without their legal status feel, and what that means for their lives. And um, unfortunately, there are a lot of attorneys out there who um, can't relate to that. And I think that when you can relate to your client, you can provide them a better service and hopefully that's what I'm doing. Hopefully I'm helping um, my clients along through the process which at times, especially now with this new administration, has become very confusing and unclear and just very messy. Um, so that's, that's what I do. 
Sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anika Shaw. I am I co-own a firm, um, Headley Shaw Law. It's located in Brooklyn. It's an immigration law firm. Um, we specialize primarily in family petitions, and you know, so we do citizenship applications and green cards, etc. Um, and we're also kind of leaning into um, more business-related transactions. Um, I was really excited to join this panel because I am also a product of immigrants. I, my parents are from Diana, and though we didn't. You know, we they never actually experienced some of these issues because they came over at the time at a time period when they were kind of letting a lot of Caribbean and South and South Americans come over without too many hassles. Like my aunt sent for my my mother, and it was very easy. I do have peers and some other family members who do face these issues, so I'm really excited to be here, and I just I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Carl Lipscomb, and I work with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. We're a national membership organization that organizes, advocates, and raises awareness around the unique challenges facing black immigrants in the US. We have offices in five, soon to be six cities, uh, New York, LA, Oakland, DC, Atlanta, and Miami, and uh, members across the country. <laughs> Thank you all so much for, for being here and for sharing your time with us. So I kind of framed this a little bit. We're going to have uh, one question at the beginning that's going to focus on national um, kind of current in the news immigration laws. And then we're going to focus the conversation a little more on New York and then really get into politics of, of criminalization. Um, so the first question for, for y'all is, can you talk a little bit about where the very famous travel ban currently stands given uh, the Ninth Circuit decision, the Hawaii decision, and, and what does that mean legally and practi practically for people now? Any, anyone can start. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we all know that the ban uh, first inst was instigated in January of this year. Um, that was actually the Fourth Circuit. Um, and everyone remembers the chaos and the news and a bunch of attorneys were at the airports trying to help everyone out. Um, so clearly, they shut that down. <laughs> um, so um, of course, the administration went ahead and tried to bring it back again, and that was in the Ninth Circuit. And the difference, I mean, they, they claimed it was different, but it was more of a, like a, I guess, a political correctness uh, sort of change, because the first one, it was, you know, they included all of seven countries, and I think the second one they took away Iraq, and then um, they had a, a they had put something out there for refugees, and they were kind of um, basically block blocking the number of refugees that were going to come into the country. And the second one, they opened up the number of refugees that they would allow in, and um, so that was that was just one of the major changes. Um, but now they're trying to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and I don't know if the Supreme Court is going to hear it. Um, I'm curious as to what's going to happen. Um, we have a new justice. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I actually just read today that one of the justices were thinking was possibly going to be uh, retiring. I'm a little nervous about what's going to happen, to be honest. Um, so even though the travel ban isn't currently in, uh, in place, you know, there's a, a temporary restraining order on it. Um, I feel like the government is, the administration is trying to do like a back doorway in. Um, so people don't know that in at airports and things like that where they're ports of entry, there is no <coughs> constitutional, uh, they can do whatever they want to do at the airports basically. Because generally we're protected by the Fourth Amendment so you can't just do searches and seizures. But at these, at these ports of entry they can and that's why you hear people saying, oh, they checked my phone and they checked my Facebook to see who I am. So these, these are issues that I feel like they're trying to just backdoor in until we can have a final um, result. So I'm very terrified uh, as to what's occurring, but I guess we just have to see what's going to happen with the Supreme Court decision. Um, all right, I'll go next. I hate to use that word terrifying because I don't want to be scared, yeah. you know? Um, and, but it, it, it certainly uh, is nerve-wracking, especially if your uh, papers aren't in order. Um, and I want to stay positive. <laughs> I really want to stay positive. Um, but I think mostly what's going on is that the people who are 
running things don't know what they're doing um, because if they knew what they were doing there wouldn't be all these ridiculous battles in circuit courts and there wouldn't have to be a, a ban or anything whoever the lawyers are on the president's side I don't think that they're doing their job effectively um, because I know you know I Personally, I love Obama, but he's done some stuff yeah. that we can all say that we don't agree with. Um, and he definitely put limits on what, who could come into the country, who these refugees could come in, and who couldn't come in, and what the limits were, and what numbers. And uh, I think this president could do that. And we probably wouldn't have heard of any of it except that he went and banned everybody. I mean, that's just, it's, it's insane. It's part of like what's going on in the immigration courts, uh, in, with USCIS. Um, everything is taking forever. Um, before, we knew you could get your work permit in 90 days. We knew you were gonna get your green card in at the latest six months. Now it's like taking a year. Sometimes you get your work permit quickly. Sometimes you don't. And you know, and and I think that's part of what they want to do. That they they want to just kind of um, keep us in ba unbalanced. Um, and then that's part of what makes it difficult to um, for also for the lawyers to represent um, our clients in the best possible way because we don't have clear answers. Um, and hopefully the, the, the Supreme Court takes, up, takes the case and says, yes, this is absolutely unconstitutional. This is incredibly, uh, what's the word? Um, oh, I'm missing the word, but it, discriminatory. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly discriminatory. Um, but uh, it's also important to realize that these things have been going on for a long time and we live in this country where discrimination is everywhere and everything that we do um, it's just so in our face right now you know it's, and I don't know that that's bad or good I, I like to know who my enemy is over who isn't my enemy and I think the fact that we know who our enemies are that it makes it easier to fight but um, Legally, I, I think they're just creating chaos, mm -hmm. and and that's that's really the, the the problem. And I don't know that that's not on purpose. Yeah. You know? So, Carl, maybe you know, um, can you? So, let's assume that it goes to the Supreme Court, and let's assume for a second that it potentially gets, you know, it says it's unconstitutional, which is very unlikely. But let's say that happens. Do you think that that addresses the underlying basis of what actually brought this to be? Not at all. And I think, um, I'm glad you asked because I was going to jump in on that. Um, a lot of attention has been given to the travel ban. And, um, you know, many people don't realize this, but three African countries um, are, you know, are amongst the countries um, where immigrants will be banned, refugees will be banned. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think the attention given the travel ban is warranted. Um, refugees are, you know, they're escaping the most traumatic experiences um, you know, some of the most traumatic experiences um, in the world in war, violence, um, natural catastrophes. Um, but I think um, what hasn't, what, what's been ignored um, by both um, immigration advocates, um, the thousands of people that showed up at airports, um, and the mainstream media are the other executive orders that the president um, has implemented. Um, and you know, even if the Supreme Court um, uh, you know, rules against the travel ban, we still have these other executive orders um, that are actually more catastrophic for people that are currently, live, um, immigrants that are currently in the US. Um, the administration um, has called for hiring 15,000 um, new immigration enforcement agents between Border Patrol and ICE agents um, they've prioritized for deportation, um, not just those with criminal convictions or criminal contact, but anyone that's committed any act that could have been charged as a crime. So that, you know, basically that means anyone that does something, you know, wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, the Supreme Court heard this case um, where the government was arguing to rescind someone's citizenship because they, um, because they, you know, 
there was a misrepresentation of their naturalization application, and it was very minor, and the Supreme Court um, asked the, uh, the DOJ attorney, so are you saying that if I, you know, you know, fudge my weight a little on my citizenship application, that um, I should have it revoked? And they said yes. Justice Roberts said, are you saying that if I, you know, exceeded the speed limit by five miles per hour, but didn't tell any, you know, didn't tell anyone and wasn't caught, that um, I should have my, uh, my citizenship revoked? And they said yes. And so really this is what we're up against. Um, you know, they're, they're really, um, you know, doing anything in their power to restrict immigration and to, and to kick immigrants out. Um, and so the, while the travel ban is important, I really, you know, if the Supreme Court hears the case, I hope that they permanently halt the travel ban. Um, you know, there are these other um, policies that are already in place that will affect us. Thank you so much for that and, and bringing attention to kind of um, what we, we're not necessarily thinking about nationally in, in the national discourse. And so talking about this a little bit and what's not talked about, um, something that is definitely talked a lot about in New York City is that New York City is a sanctuary city. We hear politicians saying this all the time. And so um, what I first want to talk about is what does that actually mean? What does it mean in New York City to be a sanctuary city? And then I want to speak a little bit to uh, whether New York City is actually a safe city for black immigrants. I think you should answer. You, you guys, because I'm mostly in New Jersey. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, okay. So um, Sanctuary City is basically, um, and New York is just one of them, um, San Francisco. I think Miami may have taken away their Sanctuary City status recently. Um, uh, just cities, a lot of cities that have a lot of immigrants, they tend to um, adapt that designation. And it's primarily just cities who are trying, who work hard to protect their immigrant population. So they sort of resist some of the federal government's um, you know, they, they resist uh, responding to several of their requests. So if ICE comes and asks for, you know, the citizens, I mean, asks for the immigrants' information, they would sort of, they wouldn't, they wouldn't comply. So these are, these are just cities that are really working to protect their immigrant populations. Sure, I mean, I think the only thing I'd add is that, in, according to the president, there are, you know, some like 250 sanctuary cities um, in the country, and they publish a list of cities they consider sanctuaries. Usually, the it pertains to like any any city that has some sort of uh, you know legislation in place that limits the ability of local law enforcement to collaborate with ICE um, or Border Patrol. Um, and so, um, you know, so there there are dozens of cities um, that have this type of legislation. Um, New York considers itself a sanctuary city. Um, I think that um, what's wrong with the designation is that in, you know, since January, um, any, you know, any, any local mayor or um, even governor that wants to be viewed as, um, you know, as a pushing back against Trump has said that my city is a sanctuary city or my state is a sanctuary, um, but oftentimes the actual policies in place don't have meat behind them. Um, so New York has an amazing law that um, severely restricts the ability of the NYPD to collaborate with ICE. The NYPD um, in most, well, in many instances, isn't supposed to, um, you know, hold someone for, for ICE. Um, it's the same with the Department of Corrections. But where New York falls short is that, one, New York shares information with the federal government, with the FBI and ICE. And two, New York City has some 170 laws on the books that um, you know that are exemptions. So if anyone is convicted of these one, of a of 170 crimes, um, they can and will be turned over to ICE. Um, I think the city also falls short in that um, ICE still is still able to have a presence um, in places where where you know where immigrants um, have to you know go day to day. So ICE um, still shows up in courthouses. Um, to arrest immigrants. They look online on this New York City website um, on when someone has a court appearance and they show up and um, they arrest um, someone in the courtroom to the point where judges sometimes set bail on the person so that ICE can't get them. Um, so those are just some of the ways, and you know, there are many others. Um, ICE is allowed to arrest people in hospitals and um, at other public locations. Yeah. In, um, in New Jersey, it's 
similar, I guess. Um, you, in New Jersey, you have um, two, a two-day window. ICE has a two-day window to pick up whoever they're going to pick up if they've been arrested. Um, and if they don't pick them up during that time, technically, then they can be released. Um, and um, ICE can't really, isn't supposed to come after that. They're supposed to come within that two-day uh, two window. Um, but unfortunately, if you're not on top of that, they come the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, and no one cares. Um, I, I live in Newark, and I also practice in Newark, and um, Newark is supposed to be uh, the sanctuary city. Um, and I think there's also <coughs> a problem with that designation because um, it makes people think that they're safe, mm -hmm. and they're not. Um, one of my, um, there's this deli I go to every morning and get my bagel and my coffee and say what's up to the guys who make it. And um, they actually live here in the Bronx. And um, apparently one of the people who lived with them had a ton of parking tickets. And so recently someone came knocking on their door. Um, and I, I always talk to them and they knew that just don't open the door, obviously, right? Um, so they didn't open the door and they had a camera to see who, so they could look out to see who was knocking on their door and they were dressed in plain clothes and they gave them some bogus number to call. And we think it's one of two things. Uh, obviously it was ICE. Um, they got a hold of this person's traffic record and because he owed a lot of tickets or something, they were coming to look for that guy. That's one. Or um, my client, uh, my, my friend, because he's not my client, his, um, his brother was recently deported and maybe they got a hold of his, um, his address um, when he deposited money when he was at the jail. Or, you know, there's just so many ways for them to gather information. It just, it just does, I don't know, I think Sanctuary City um, benefits more the city, bringing people in, making sure there's people working. Um, then it really benefits the immigrants or protects the immigrants. Thank you, and I just wanted to add a little bit, um, I think our panelists alluded to this, when they were talking about how the policies don't match up to what they're saying, and so to give you like a very concrete example, for example, if someone jumps a turnstile and they're arrested by a police officer and they go into the precinct and they get, finger, get, they get fingerprinted, those fingerprints go into the federal system which taps ICE. Uh, and so this idea that police are not necessarily colluding with federal agents that are then deporting people is actually just not true. Um, and, and then when you think about who is getting arrested for jumping turnstiles, then we go into a conversation not only about undocumented folks but and immigrants, but poor people and poor people of color. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to say related to this was the fact that we hear a lot about, well, Trump is going to stop funding and de Blasio has said, I will take him to court. Right? And when you look at what the actual funding that uh, would be taken away from the city of, of New York, uh, a small percentage of that would go to things like housing and to things like health care. But the majority of that money is going into an NYPD task force that's particularly looking at terrorism. And when you talk to community members and when you talk to people, it's those entities that are directly impacting them in, in violent ways and then putting them into the system in the first place. And so if, we're, if, if de Blasio actually wants to think about those ways, then, then don't fight for that money, right? Um, and of course, it's, it's a harder conversation to have. Um, just wanted to add those two pieces. Can I add something about de Blasio? I also mm -hmm. read that he was trying to expand the crimes. So mm -hmm. out of, in addition to the 170 crimes that he was trying to actually add to those, add to those crimes, so actually, if you're trying to be this sanctuary city, why would you increase crimes which would make, you know, which would, you know, in essence, you know, have people lead to more de um, deportations? Like, I just don't understand. So I do think it's just sort of, it's, it's not necessarily a genuine uh, attempt, I think, at, at what he's saying. I think it's more just something, like you said, sound good to make the city sound like, okay, we're welcome and we're trying to fight Trump, but you're doing things um, contrary to what you actually supposedly stand for. And Carlos. 
Sure, Ian. And then I had uh, one other thing. I know that um, for those of you that were here this morning, uh, the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs was on a panel. Um, my son, Sam, who I went to law school with, um, works there. And um, he talked about the New York Immigrant Family um, Unification Project, NIAFUB, which is New York's uh, program that provides um, legal representation to any immigrant um, that um, has a case um, in immigration court downtown on Varick Street. Um, and it's been a widely successful program over the last four or five years. Um, and this year, um, the mayor has proposed um, you know, the program no longer representing immigrants that have any sort of criminal contact. Um, so this is, you know, this is a successful program. Um, it's, and you know, they've justified it saying it's too expensive, yet they've increased funding for the program over the years. Um, all of the, uh, the city, the public defender offices and legal service agencies um, that are contracted to provide this service, um, you know, talk about how successful it is. And many of the people that, um, you know, that uh, the mayor's thinking of, uh, you know, pulling attorneys away from are the, ex the exact people that need attorneys. Um, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but I think it's like immigrants that have an attorney are 10 times more likely to win their case in immigration court. So if we're really a sanctuary, why are we taking this important protection away from the immigrants that need it the most? Like, you know, the, the right to an attorney and the ability to have representation is, you know, one would think that's like the floor if we're, if we're considering ourselves a sanctuary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we've talked a little bit about, a lot actually about, you know, kind of the problems and we, I think the people in the room kind of get a gist of, of where we are. And so I think now I want to turn a little bit to possible particular legal solutions to, to what we're seeing um, to anti-black, anti-Latinx, anti-immigrant laws and, and practices. And then after we talk about that, we're going to talk about non-legal solutions. So first, legal solutions that you all see. And of course, the panelists have um, come to the work in different ways. Um, and so they're going to you know, bring that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have ideas. <laughs> Um, the part, the, the difficulty is implementing those ideas, implementing that uh, resistance um, without messing up your client's case, um, without um, messing up the goodwill that you've created over the years with the trial attorneys and the judges and everyone in the, in the immigration world. Um, that's, that's where I'm coming, that's where my perspective comes from. Um, the other day I was in court and um, I made a motion to, uh, to close the case because um, my client um, is eligible for uh, adjustment, he can become a resident. Um, and the child attorney didn't have her file and blah, 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 blah. And now they're just, there's a, now she has to ask permission to close the case that normally we would have normally closed because this guy can become a resident. It's not, he doesn't have a criminal record. He has the proper entry. Um, he ha he's married to a US citizen. They, it's been, um, USCA has found that they're in a legitimate, bona fide marriage. It's something easy that should have just been closed um, with the documents that I provided her, even though she didn't have the file. And um, so maybe I shouldn't have done this. I don't know. <laughs> um, but all she had to do was approve, uh, just approve it, you know. But now there's um, there's legislation, or I think the BIA came down with a case that says that the judge has the authority to close cases. To, if, if they don't have to take into consideration ICE's reasons for not closing the case, um, because their priorities are not the Department of Justice's priorities, right? Um, so I made the motion before the judge to terminate proceedings so that this man could continue on with his path uh, to adjustment. Um, and the judge, the first thing out of the judge's mouth was, well, I can't go against the government mm -hmm. position, Ms. Carrillo, and I was like, excuse me. <laughs> um, that was the first thing he said, and then he, was, and then he quickly caught himself. And, and he said, well, what are your reasons? Oh, well, he's eligible. He's, we should be able to close this out. Well, at this time, the government doesn't have their file, so I'm going to have to deny your motion to terminate, blah, blah, blah. And it just causes a lot of delays. But if everybody would resist in that way, if everybody made that motion, then, I don't know, maybe there could be a class action, or maybe some of these judges would 
approve the um, the motion to terminate when it's so obvious. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, the other way, I guess, is just papering them. Like, this is what they do in civil courts. They just file motion after motion after motion after motion, and hopefully somebody will do something. Um, but that just creates a lot more work for us. Um, and if you're doing immigration work, you know it's just a lot of work already. Um, so there's, it's just really hard to resist in that way. Um, but that's really the way that I'm, I'm going to combat them. And my personal relationships with them or the goodwill that we've created, I guess this is gonna have to go to hell, right? Because your client comes first, their safety comes first, their, their lives are more important than this trial attorney who is just following orders, you know? Um, and just file whatever motion, file whatever you need to do to make sure that your client is um, zealously represented because they are zealously denying everything, so. You kind of answered that. That was a hard <laughs> question for me, but no, you kind of, I basically just can pay me back on that. Um, you know, like you said, as attorneys, we do need to just be, just be the best advocates that we can for our clients. Um, try every little angle, try whatever we can because we're up against a monster, basically, and the only way we can do that is if we just, you know, tr be creative. Like as attorneys, you have to be creative with your solutions. Um, yeah, you might not necessarily just be able to follow the. There's no straight path. You kind of have to like, you know, find that like little arbitrary statute somewhere or whatever you can, just so that we can just get whatever we need to do to represent our clients um, properly. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo um, everything that's been said, but I think more importantly, we we actually just need more, um, particular in particular, black attorneys um, to take immigration cases and to develop expertise in immigration law um, and to actually represent our communities. Um, you know, a lot of the, the more difficult cases, um, they're hard, they're expensive, um, and but they're, you know, they're, and sometimes um, people in our community, you know, can't afford um, a big law firm um, to take their cases. Um, but I think, you know, they, they need us. They need, they need us um, to represent them um, in immigration court. Um, so I think, you know, we need more attorneys. And then I think that we need more immigration attorneys in general, black and non-black, to develop immigration litigation experience. Um, oftentimes, immigration is kind of uh, whittled down. Um, it's almost what I would consider more transactional um, contract law, where we're just assisting um, people with petitions and with applications. Um, but we, you know, we need um, more immigration attorneys that can go in, go in court and make um, innovative, compelling arguments on behalf of their clients, and they can also also know how to um, operate at the appellate level at the BIA, the, the BIA um, and the Court of Appeals levels. The second circuit and the third circuit. The second circuit and the third circuit. Carl, keep the mic, and why don't you now um, talk a little bit to us about non possible non legal solutions that could help. Sure, there's like a, <laughs> I have a laundry list here. That's why I was writing most of the time. Um, but I think so, um, you know, my organization, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to address the solutions, um, you know, from what we consider the beginning of the process where immigrants are criminalized um, on the streets, often by police um, or just by nature of being in this country um, without papers and, you know, on the back end. Um, so I think, you know, first, um, you know, we need to work to repeal um, the 1996 immigration laws which expanded the grounds for deportation to some, a couple of dozen offenses um, that are, you know, range from possession of, you know, small amounts of marijuana to turnstile hops to like, um, I had a client who, when I was um, a public defender, who threw an orange at a teacher, he was 17, he threw an orange at a teacher, he was charged with assault and he was deportable. And so that's how easy it is um, to, you know, to end up in deportation proceedings. So we need to roll back the 1996 laws we need to address, um, you know, as a, you know, as 
folks that care about immigration, we also need to care about criminal justice. So we need to address practices like broken windows policing. Um, most immigrants, um, in particular black immigrants, or immigrants in general, live side by side with African Americans in communities that are um, over-policed and they're subject to police abuse and they're more likely to have contact with the criminal system, um, which even if it doesn't result in a, a conviction, um, again, just having that contact or you know being charged with something um, can now put one at risk of being detained by ICE. Um, so that um, you know, I think um, you know we, uh, my organization, is starting to look at um, bonds reform. Um, so uh, it's in there are very few cases, but there, but in some instances, immigration judges are allowed to um, you know set bond on someone, and, and if they're able to pay it, they can get out. Um, this is often um, provided to asylum seekers, um, but um, the bond is so expensive. It's usually like the average bond is ten thousand dollars, and obviously immigrants that are you know people that are new to the country um, that have spent all their money getting here can't afford that. And so we're looking at bond reform and have worked with um, nationally with the Movement for Black Lives to raise money to start bonding out um, immigrants. So those are just some things, but I'm sure others have more. Um, that was that was really great. Um, I really want to learn more about your organization. Um, wasn't really familiar with it before. No, but I, I feel like you guys are doing a, a great job. Um, I would look at. I, I think I would consider some of um, like local politicians, local like get involved in that level um, because you know if enough of us actually go to these, you know, go to our communities and say, okay, we're demanding certain things happen. I feel like that's a way that we can actually see change. Um, I'm not an advocate for any particular party or anything like that, but for instance, like Eric Gonzalez, who's running for the DA, um, he just he just created a, he, he's advocating a, a policy that would, um, so like al alternative prosecutions for um, immigrants. So instead of just, you know, when you go, when you go to um, court and you're found guilty, that's automatic, you're, you know, that's gonna trigger ICE, et cetera, et cetera. He's basically trying to advocate for something where we do alternative prosecutions, where we you can you can still find the person guilty, but let's not make them guilty for something that we know can get them deported. You know, so I feel like those sort of things are very very important. Um, so I think getting involved in that local level, just seeing who your local representatives are, that's like key, um, so we can actually get our voices heard. I want to learn more about your organization. <laughs> 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 I, you know, something you said about the bond uh, reform, that sounds amazing. The thing with bonds is that sometimes you have a judge that will give you a $3,000 bond and then another judge will give you the $10,000 bond on the same case. And that's really, you know, that's not justice. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that sounds like something that I would be interested in, you know, participating in. Um, I think solutions are, are always best with, when they start with education. So if we know more about our communities and we know more, and, we, and, and the information that we have, we can share it with our community, um, I think we can do more. And maybe it's giving talks in schools, you know, to elementary school children, because they, they're the <coughs> ones who go back home and tell their parents, um, or even have the parents come in. This, I, I don't know, I, I think that's probably where, where I would start. And, and it would, um, with, um, with organizations like the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, um, with bar organizations, New York bar organizations. Um, what I've noticed recently is that with the travel ban, now there's more of an interest with attorneys and how they can help. What can I do? That's what a lot of attorneys said when all of this started. Um, and there, obviously there's just a handful of immigration attorneys because we're, we're really not racking up the dough, you know? Not really making a lot of money. Um, so um, the one, maybe if we can get some of those um, black lawyers and those Latino lawyers and Latinx lawyers um, to learn some of these things, and, may, and, and not just take one pro bono case, you know, uh, once a year or twice a year, and, and have five attorneys on one case, you know? Maybe if we can teach 
are attorneys, you know, you can make some money, you know, go to your big law firms, do what you gotta do, that's great. Um, but also take the time to learn how to protect your people because that's how, that's one of the reasons I became a lawyer. I didn't wanna be a lawyer. I, I wanted to be a pediatrician. <laughs> Um, but you realize that um, your community is in harm's way. Um, there's no way to, especially if you're black, there's no way to hide that. How, could you, how do you hide that, you know? Um, and it's, it's really hard. And I, I just, I think that it, it starts with education. So if we can get those elementary school kids, you know, some information, we can get the junior high school kids some information, the law school kids some information, then maybe they'll be willing to um, take on a bigger role in the fight. Um, because when you're ignorant of the law, you can't maneuver it. You can't maneuver through it. And, and, and I, felt that, I felt that desperation at the border. I, I didn't know what I could do to help. And I didn't know how to protect myself or protect my family. And the funny thing is, at that time, I was a, I was a permanent resident. And I, w I, I went to college with all these kids. They're all doing drugs. They're all doing all sorts of crazy stuff, you know? And one second, I'm in that car with that kid who had some, you know, some marijuana in his pocket or something. And that kid's a citizen, and I'm not. I could have, they could have taken me. I could, I could be, you know, in Guatemala somewhere. Even though I've been here so long, I, I would have had to go in front of a judge and explain why I was in a car with somebody who had drugs, you know? Um, and that happens all the time. And if we don't find a way to get this information to our communities, then how do we protect those kids that are coming up, you know? Um, so that's, that, that would be one of my solutions. Thank you. Yeah, I heard um, more black attorneys, more Latinx attorneys, more attorneys of color, and, and I would add that we need more of those attorneys, but also those attorneys who have our shared interests, and, and those attorneys who have conviction, and are willing to sacrifice in ways in which people who might share our identity aren't, and are therefore creating laws that are actually vi violent to our people. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, connected to that, possible ways of, non-legal possible ways of assisting this movement is, is also assisting organization and organizers like Baji, like the Movement for Black Lives, like Mi Gente, people really uh, are working with directly impacted people movement lawyers uh, and organizers to to not only shift the laws but also think of a different existence think of a different way of being towards ourselves towards each other um, who, who are the people that are actually being dehumanized by a lot of these policies and, and practices so related to that there's been a lot of conversations nationally especially with a president who has said things such as people from Mexico are rapists uh, and, and drug lords and all these awful things. Or, you know, under President Obama who said that he was merely targeting people who have convicted, you know, made felonies and serious crimes, but we know he deported much more people than that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so along those lines, can you all speak a little bit to how um, conversations in the country, law and policy criminalizes immigrants and particularly the connection with immigrants and, and black folks? Anybody could, could start with that. I'll start. <laughs> sure, and um, thanks for this question. I think um, yeah. the you know there's a there's this framework that I think a lot, increasingly immigration advocates are starting to push back against of this like good versus bad immigrant. Um, you know, Obama. It's best stated. Obama said we're you know we're protecting like you know we're going after felons, not families. Um, and of course, under immigration law, the definition of felon includes um, a 16-year-old at Hobson Subway turnstile. Um, so you know, there's a question of one who we're really going after. But um, I think the bigger question is like how you know, like ways in which attorneys um, and advocates in general, um, you know, that are well-meaning, also push um, a narrative that's um, anti-black and um, throws certain immigrants under the bus. And so there, there are like three things that um, like I like to push against. First is this idea of that immigrants are here, um, you know, to, are here to, for economic opportunities and to get an education. Um, every June, we see dozens of news stories about the immigrant valedictorian, or we hear about the immigrant business owner, or um, unions like to talk about how they're protecting immigrant workers. 
Um, and I think the problem with that narrative is because that's a very small handful of immigrants that are the valedictorian um, or that um, are even college educated or that own businesses. And those types of narratives um, are often um, you know, juxtaposed against stereotypes of African Americans and of black people as being lazy and uneducated and criminals. Mm -hmm. The second is um, this idea of um, immigrant integration and assimilation. Um, and you know the idea that um, you know it'll, things will get better if immigrants are fully able to integrate into um, our society, and that's not true. And any black person in the U.S. will tell you that um, you know that that it's you know they've had trouble integrating into 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 our society. Once some um, immigrants um, are able to integrate, other other problems will still exist. Um, but also, um, you know, at least some. Um, you know, really when we talk about, um, you know, when we, when we perpetuate this idea that um, integration will solve all problems facing immigrants, what we're saying is that, um, you know, immigrants will be able to integrate where black people have failed. Um, you know, black people have been unable to fully exercise their voting rights, and they, black people have had all these opportunities, but they still haven't been able to get an education and still, um, you know, have high unemployment rates. And then the third thing is this idea of the path to citizenship being like the magic wand that's gonna also gonna solve all of our problems. Um, and I believe citizenship is an important protection and probably the most important protection right now um, since uh, the president's trying to deport everyone. But again, that's not a magic bullet. Once immigrants gain citizenship, there's, you know, being a citizen um, isn't gonna make you white. It's not you're still going to be black and brown and and, and um, you know victims of uh, over policing and police violence and face discrimination um, across the board. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, what I what I find particularly interesting about this question is uh, the aspect of capitalism, mm -hmm. um, because I, I agree with everything he said. Um, but in, I'm, I'm taking it in another direction. Um, I think that what they're doing is all about the money, you know? So let's get as many people in jail, let's get as many of these immigrants who are bad people um, so that we can um, make some money, so that we can fill up these, um, these private jails and um, ha have the shareholders happy. Um, so that we can, you know, increase our portfolios or whatever it is that they're, however it is that they make money. I, I'm not good at making money, so I don't, um, I'm not really sure how that works, but um, I do know that there are people in immigration detention facilities who should not be there. Um, I, for stupid things and things that happened 15, 20 years ago, all of a sudden now you want to arrest them. They haven't committed any other crime since 15, 20 years ago, but now because you know, we have different priority enforcement priorities, um, we're filling up beds and basically that means somebody is putting money into their pockets. Um, and they're doing that not only with African Americans, they're doing that with um, Mexicans, you know, or Latinos, um, Haitians, blacks, whites. It's not just the black and white or Latino issue. This is, they're, they're definitely using immigrants of all colors, of all, you know, um, walks of life to um, ensure that their projects are going forward and that they get richer and then, um, and that just perpetuate this, this cycle of, um, of capitalism basically, um, to, to the, to, unfortunately to our detriment, because these are our communities these, that are um, getting fa their fathers ripped out. Um, the main breadwinners are getting ripped out of, uh, out of their lives and it's creating poverty. And what happens when you don't have jobs? What happens when things don't go well in your family? Some people turn to crime, some people have mental issues and and even having someone in in a facility that th that person doesn't belong there to begin with it creates mental issues and then now you have mental health problems in, uh, just all over our community and and it's it's just a vicious nasty cycle of keeping people incarcerated and 
It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think this is a great point about uh, kind of follow the money. Um, but of course, we know that, you know, particularly in America, uh, systems of oppression through economic models, through capitalism in this country, has always been tied to racial hierarchies, um, going all the way back to, to slavery. And so I think we, we are running up on time. Thank you all so much for staying a, a little later. Um, so I, I'm going to consolidate. I'm going to try to consolidate my last question and then open it up to, to you all and actually ask you all a question as well. Um, so this question is for the panelists. The idea of, of if we had to identify certain leverage points to bring about transformative change. Right? This, is, this is where we dream big. Not just, not just like the incremental steps, but, but what would those leverage points be to, to actually bring about the change that would allow immigrants and, and black people and, and Latinx people and all people to have better lives and healthy lives. And related to that question then becomes, what does a just immigration system look like? Um, and, and does that even look like one at all? Right, like do we even have uh, borders to begin with? And so I guess I want to, like if the, maybe I want to invite the, the, the audience to maybe answer like their 30 second commercial sound bite of, of the answer to that question if you can. So then I think the panelists can end by kind of sharing their thoughts of, of what that would look like. Anyone? Can you say it one more time? Yes. <laughs> yes. So can you imagine what a just immigration system looks like? What does that look like? 30 seconds. Doesn't have to be the full answer. I know this is like a really huge, huge thing, so you can just name a piece of that or, or anything. I'm looking at Lupe, I'm looking at Coloma. <laughs> well, oh. shout out, no, go for it. To get one point, it would start with the narrative around immigration that often paints uh, the United States as some, as some savior. Mm -hmm. And so recognize that Anytime you have a mass movement of people, there's a force that's driving that. And um, as the country that likes to say we're number one in a number of things, we're number one in a lot of violent things. Mm, yeah. And so attach that to why these population shifts are occurring in the first place and not paint it as here we are in the United States and you know, people just keep showing up at our doorsteps. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, just beginning with the American value of family as priority preeminent and divorcing the criminal justice system as a as the means to it, to to enforce immigration policy. Yeah. Jason? Um, I would say, and this kind of goes back to some of what we were talking about before, um, but one that could be described as humanitarian. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, I mean, to me, when I look at it is I would just like to know that everyone who goes through any type of proceeding, one way or another, at least just a start, you know, they, you know, they're treated as individuals and are treated with respect, and they have the same, you know, you know, there's certain constitutional rights anyone's supposed to have, regardless of your citizenship. You know, and I was talking about this a little before, but the fact that, you know, they have, you know, the same type of due process. There's all this talk about, you know, expedited removals where they're going to try to get rid of folks, you know, without even being before a judge. You know, I'd like, you know, regardless of outcome for each individual, that that person to be able to say that, you know, I had, you know, a fair opportunity that I was treated with respect and. Uh, uh, that was treated like a community. Mm -hmm. So I'm turning over to the panelists, maybe for concluding thoughts based on that and the idea of <coughs> where are the leverage points for transformative change. Um, so two things actually was inspired by, I believe, this young man in the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I, I've always thought about is just ours versus them or theirs concept where a lot of, we're all immigrants in the United States. Like, we basically came here, we, well, not we, sir, I would say white settlers or whatever, they came and they stole the land of people who were living here. So number one, the discourse needs to change and we sort of had this idea this is our country. Uh, it's not really our country, it's a country that was basically taken and then we adopted it as ours. But So really, it's whoever wants to come in because that's what we did, that's what, the people who chose to steal the country did. <laughs> um, so that's just one thing, I was just thinking about that. Um, 
something else, just because of like in our practice, we noticed this. Um, there's just like a lot of disparities amongst different types of immigrants. So that's something that I would love to be addressed. So, you know, with the different visa categories, for instance, um, you know, we have like we'll see like entertainment visas or you know just different visas. There's different time periods and just different stipulations that different groups of um, people have to face. So an Eastern European person can come in here and they can, you know, they don't have all these barriers to entry. It's, you know, one, two, three, something, you know, they might be able to get a visa, it's five years, you know. And then we have a, a person from the Caribbean, someone from Jamaica, they come in and there's this, 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 they have to check off. It's for two years. And it's just like, why is it that that's the case? That, so that's where I would like to see the, the I, I just need some fairness across the board in how things are allocated amongst different groups. So that's, though, that's what I would see as a just immigration system. It's hard to answer that question because I think, um, or without speaking in almost utopian terms, because <laughs> our immigration system itself is so unjust that I was, you know, I was trying to think of like, what are the bullet points that I'd want to see? And they bump up against something else that's egregious. Um, and so, I mean, I think I concluded that, I, you know, the entire system, it needs to be blown up and upended and like, you know, you know, a few years ago, we invested, the country invested billions of dollars in thinking of, uh, you know, in green jobs and environmental technologies and sustainability. And we haven't done the same thing with some of the, some of, of the other social challenges that we face, like immigration and criminalization. And I think it's really time for us to, you know, to, to innovate and think of solutions um, because, um, you know, people are in crisis. Um, and I think whatever solutions we come up with, I'd echo what Jason said, um, you know, we have to make sure that people are treated with dignity and respect and um, that um, basic human rights are upheld. Um, and I, you know, if I was going to get specific, I know that there are at least a few things that I'd start with, and that's one, abolishing detention. Um, immigration is a civil offense. Um, so why are we detaining people? We don't do that with other civil offenses. Dismantling ICE. Um, we talk about how ICE is, you know, we hear our elected officials say, ICE isn't able to do its job, or the system isn't working. Um, you know, they're not getting everyone. If a program isn't working, get dismantle it, get rid of it. And then I think we need to um, stop deporting people, or at minimum, place a moratorium on deportations until we're actually able to fix our immigration system. system's so broken in the immigration courts there's it's taken a while to deport some people so I like that part of it um, I actually am more on the utopian side right um, and I I think our the main problem that we have is that we are an imperialist nation <laughs> and we cause trouble everywhere we go so we have problems with Latinos or Latinx coming into the United States. Why? Because we stick our noses in stuff that we shouldn't be sticking our noses in. And when we do need to be there to try to help, we mess things up. We create situations that we have to deal with now that were created, you know, decades, centuries ago. Um, and and we, we didn't just do that, obviously, in Latin America. We've done that all over the world. If we hadn't done any of those things, or if we were more mindful of the wars that we get into, if we were less um, inclined to, again, um, stuff our pockets with money, um, then perhaps we would be able to be more humanitarian. We, we'd be able to deal with, um, we, we may have less immigrants because there'd be more um, economies thriving all over the world. Um, it would, I don't know, I think that the real issue here is that we're dealing with an imperialist country, you know, who causes damage, and then we come here and, and then, oh, no, let's get rid of these immigrants, they're messing up our country. We, we messed up their countries, you know? They messed up our country. So um, I think this is sort of payback, right? Mm -hmm. We're coming to take what's ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> and some of the Mexicans, this is their country, you know? Yes. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents. And on that note, <laughs> uh, please help me in thanking all of our panelists. For coming up so we are way over. I don't know if anyone has a question or two that's a burning question right now. Um, 
I would just like to say something because I listened quite carefully about the comments on black lawyers and we need more black lawyers. One of the things I've always said to people is that we as a black people, we need to be, um, we need to be more conscious of who we are and appreciate ourselves. Um, I often see in my practice people who come to me and they try to pin down their price and then they go to Manhattan and pay some non-black person a lot of money and then they come back to you and say, I can't pay. Mm -hmm. It's just not available. We have to take responsibility and believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. That's true. Great point. I would, uh, I don't know if anyone has anything to add. I think that's a great point. I think that um, we have to be mindful of the fact that people are breathing the same air, meaning that we have been previewed for centuries um, and, and we have been organized to think that even if we are lawyers, we are still less than. And in many ways, when white people represent people of color in court, they oftentimes have better outcomes. It's not to say it's right. It's to say that we have to change the structures that are causing people to think this. It's not just that this person itself has some intent against me. Um, and so I'm totally with you, but I think we should be loving to our community and, and bring them in and, and kind of just move them to a place where they're not necessarily being demonized for, for thinking that way, if that makes sense. Anyone else? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't have a question. I have a quick comment. First of all, that's profound, phenomenal, wonderful presentation. And I just want to like uplift the message. One of your sentences was like on point, but the particular message is about you know, the oppression of black people, of people of color generally, black people specifically, and the intersection of that in our capitalist system. Like, I don't think that can be understand, like it can't be lifted enough. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as advocates, we all have responsibility to like see that intersection and, and work against it. Mm -hmm. Because this is a system that is bent on exploiting and oppressing us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you. You know, and as black attorneys, you mentioned, um, you know, the clients going to, South, going to Manhattan, et cetera. I think we need to also make our presence more known in the communities. Like, I was, because this is actually like the first panel I've ever done, and I was like, you know, I really want to start going out and just being a part of where my people are because they're going to be forced to come to you eventually. Like, if you're in someone's face and you're saying, hey, this is what I offer, this is, I feel like we just need to let our presences be known. If not, other people are going to come in and easily take that because we, I, we listen to, we, I listen to radio and I hear, like, no offense to anyone, but like you hear the Jewish guy in these Caribbean stations, and it kind of irks me. They're they're on the stations, and they're like, oh, we do immigrate, and I'm like, wait, why are we not on this radio station speaking to our people? And everyone's calling in. They're like, oh yeah, yeah. And I'm like, how did this guy? Well, how is he able to like infiltrate in and do that? But I'm thinking, you know, maybe we're just not letting our presences be known, and that's something that as Black attorneys we have to like work on. Um, so that's just my one little point to that. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you all so much.